U.S. Um, this is, uh, uh, we're doing a lot of work in Guangzhou. This is the Guangzhou High Speed Rail Station, and it's uh, almost Pyrenaean in size and scale, uh, but it's, it's kind of out uh, in the country. And in terms of land use, one of the things about this particular station is um, that, you, you know, you can see it, it's, from the minute you walk in, it's pretty dramatic stuff uh, and very large scale. The, China is in a place where land use is at a point of saturation, and so this is out a little further, kind of like an airport, and I think that the intent and the proper intent is satellite cities, and then connected with the main city by, 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 by really serious rail connection of some form. So the idea of jamming it right into the middle of Guangzhou was not realistic in some ways, and also from a policy standpoint, because of the energy that these stations create, they create, um, uh, they create uh, the opportunity for new towns, new cities. And so this is the inside of the station in Guangzhou, and this is the line that's going to go all the way up across country to Beijing. So it is profoundly uh, dramatic, as is the Wuhan station. Um, lots of, again, lots of lines going through it, and, um, this is, this is kind of the experience on the new fastest line. It wasn't a great day, so the picture quality isn't quite wonderful, but, but it's, um, you'll, you'll see it's pretty cool, nonetheless. I strung together a couple of short um, images. And, and uh, the, um, this line can travel up to 250 miles an hour right now. They're running at about 215 to 220 miles an hour. And um, um, this, the, the main grid of lines will be the Guangzhou, Beijing through Wuhan and Shanghai uh, connections. Um, uh, Guangzhou has a population something around 14 million people. Uh, uh, Shanghai is something around 20 million and Beijing is something over 30 million. So, you know, we're talking again significant uh, scale here. And uh, uh, you can see the thing is just flying, you know, kind of leaving the urban area. And then it gets quite beautiful. It's quite beautiful. Out in the countryside, again, you know, it was a rainy day, so we weren't getting much uh, in terms of the scenery part. It's, it's actually not even as loud as that. Uh, very comfortable. Again, very, very smooth. I'm hand holding the camera, so that kind of and, uh, you know, all of the trains have redoubts. So, you know, we're, we're, we're traveling around, you know, 210, 215 miles an hour, just kind of down on the track. I took, uh, I, I took the train out to the first stop, which is um, about an hour out, about 250 miles away, you know, just kind of blasted out. Took some pictures and came back, uh, you know, uh, just because you can. And, uh, and again, you don't have to reserve it. You just go there and you take the next train because they, again, they leave them like every 15 minutes. Um, so again, th this is altering the landscape, but it's consistent with the urbanization policy of, of the, the country. And, and the high-speed rail and in California will do the same thing. In fact, I saw a plan for, I don't know if there's anybody here from Fresno, but I saw a plan for redoing the area around the station in Fresno uh, for a proposed high-speed rail in one of the rail newsletters. And my instant reaction was way too small, way too small, because not just not thinking far enough ahead. And the density immediately around the station you know, it was not really contemplating the impact long term that that uh, the, you know these rail processes would have. And then the last part of this one, you begin to see the speed because you know you're looking at stuff that's very close to the track. So when you're looking out in the distance, it doesn't look like much, but then when you're seeing the stuff go by close, it's it's really flying. Um, and these are just some shots of the landscape. These are some stills. Uh, it's really, you know, beautiful countryside. Uh, I was just using a little handheld camera or something. And, and this is the station I went to. 
and uh, uh, it, it's called Chang uh, Shan, uh, and uh, it's a town uh, of some size. They built this uh, big railway station, but again, you know, and and you know, the little English there. Um, uh, 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 again, it's all going to change, and it's going to change extremely uh, quickly. Um, and then uh, finally, here, just to just to show you, you know, the impact of this, I, I collect these news articles. Okay, high-speed rail links to be doubled by 2012. Talked about that a little. Um, you don't see this headline in the United States. Okay. That's not a good thing. We are, we are being left in the dust. Okay? You're getting a perspective from a guy who goes over there every four to six weeks, getting left in the dust on a policy level and on a money level and an execution level because they have the mentality there that they want to do things. Our primary mentality outside of this room is we don't want to do things and we've got to fix that. Um, you know, again, just headlines. That this is the linking of re this is regional linking Shanghai, Nanjing, Hangzhou. It's profoundly changing the Shanghai Hangzhou relationship, which is kind of the Shanghai Hangzhou re relationship is kind of like San Francisco, San Jose, except Hangzhou is a little further away. But it, you know, the dynamics of what it's done in terms of coupling, and it's only been there for less than a year. The coupling that's happening from high-speed rail between Hangzhou and Shanghai is creating all kinds of new things because they, they merge as entities. You know, you get on high-speed rail and in less than an hour you're in Hangzhou. So you can have a business meeting come back, it's quicker than going across town sometimes. So everything is changing. Um, and um, uh, things are not just absolutely all going. So I pulled a couple of articles like this one. You know, there are land use wrangles that do happen, but they do get resolved and, um, and things go on. This is kind of a scary slide to me. Um, China is doing, uh, you know, infrastructure improvement, um, you know, a $200 billion. Uh, the rest of Asia, another $200 billion. The European Union is quite high, and America just isn't doing enough. We're way, we're way short on our goals. Um, the other thing we're missing, which is not part of this group, but it's a big policy issue, the other thing we're missing is that China has gone from an absorber of other people's technology, as they often do, to an exporter, okay? First of all, on the import side, so here's Bombardier doing high-speed rail in China, okay? Where is America building stuff that should be being used in China? Not happening and uh, not in this field. And here's China exporting $10 billion of their railway knowledge to Brazil, okay? America isn't exporting railway knowledge to anybody last I looked. So, so like I said, you know, my job is to make you kind of irritated, and because I am, uh, about what we're doing. And then, you know, um, uh, not just China, Japan, and others uh, can, you know, uh, learn and follow and maybe move ahead. And the, the governor was doing a good job of trying to push that. So um, that's kind of the things from my perspective of, of a user and, and very active in a lot of large scale projects over there, uh, which is that, that China has taken it and advanced it at a speed and a pace and comprehensiveness that, that until you really see it, you don't quite get it. And I wanted to give that message here uh, and that I spent my time on that rather than the urban planning side because I think we really have to figure out how to move our program ahead much, much more quickly uh, than we are. We kind of talk about it and cheerleader it and it's not enough. We've we, we got to really figure out how to get it done. Thank you. <laughs>